All right. Uh, two weeks ago, two weeks Wednesday night, uh, we started the Centurions. Uh, we got in, started on Cornelius. We noted that he's only mentioned in Acts chapter 10 by name, although there's references to what the events that happen in Acts 10, both in Acts chapter 11 and in other places as well. Uh, we know that this is the first time that he and his house being full Gentiles, this is the first time that a full true Gentile is baptized into Christ Jesus. And by doing so, it's acknowledged that a person doesn't have to be a Jew, a person doesn't have to be a proselyte uh, or a Samaritan in order to become saved. They don't have to be circumcised according to the old law to be saved. Uh, and this is what ultimately leads the brethren in Acts 11 and verse 18 back in Jerusalem to acknowledge that God has granted the Gentiles the opportunity to be saved just as we have. <clears throat> so um, as we've gotten into Acts chapter 10, we note there in verse 2 that there are four characteristics that are listed here. Uh, they are repeated in verse, well, most of them are repeated in verse 22. Uh, but there are four characteristics that are listed for Cornelius. One is that he's a devout man. What does it mean to be devout? Devoted. Okay, devoted. Dedicated. dedicated, devoted, yep. Sometimes people, they, they think that devout means uh, perfect or righteous. A devout doesn't necessarily mean perfect or righteous. As you said, it's devoted or dedicated, and certainly the fact that this is devout, would it fit the definition of righteous or pure in this instance? If Cornelius is righteous, then does he need to have somebody come and tell him what to do? I mean, if he has no need for forgiveness of sins because he's right in the sight of God, then why would Peter need to come and talk to him? And so it's not that he was righteous uh, or that he was right in the sight of God. It was that he was devoted. He and his whole household, uh, we're told in verse 2, feared God. We talked about how it was he came about learning about uh, Jehovah. And, and my best guess is that he heard it from the Jews. Not enough to, uh, to become a Jew himself. Certainly uh, there may have been some cultural issues there especially being a centurion of the Roman army, he may not have been able to, whatever the case may have been. But he did believe in Jehovah, not just the Roman gods, but in Jehovah. Uh, and, and certainly we know that uh, starting in verse, uh, I think it's in verse 22, it's mentioned that uh, Cornelius had a good reputation among all the Jews. So the community of the Jews in Caesarea knew of Cornelius, and it seems like they had a good relationship uh, with each other. So presumably that's in some form or fashion how he came about the understanding of Jehovah. Uh, we find in verse 2, so he's devout, he feared God. What does it mean to fear God? We know he's devoted and dedicated, so what does it mean to fear God? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what he did do, what his job is, what he feels about God. It dictates his thoughts. So this was how he lived his life. Yeah. Not just towards God or one thing. Many times we're devoted to you know one or a few things, but to to have this description is is a very special matter. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and the fact that he was devoted, and you couple that with fearing God, shows just the depth of his faith in Jehovah. I mean, that shows, the fact that this wasn't just a passing, a passing fad or, or kind of a passing thought. I heard about Jehovah. He seems all right, you know. He understood, again, whether he had any knowledge of the old law or not, we don't know. Whether he had knowledge of prophecy or anything like that, don't know. But we know he knew about Jehovah, presumably again from the Jews. Maybe he had heard or read some ancient or some uh, uh, Old Testament scripture. But in terms of, of exactly what he knew, we don't know. But it was enough 
that he was devoted to, to Jehovah. He feared Jehovah. Now, to fear Jehovah, what does that mean? What, what, what do I have to recognize for it to be said of me that I fear Jehovah? Okay, so I believe everything that Jehovah said. And I believe that he did everything that is recorded that Jehovah said he did. Okay, the Old Testament uh, scriptures referring to the miracles he performed, the signs and wonders that he did with Israel and so forth. What else? Okay, recognition that he exists. And obviously this is, this is contrasted with the gods of the Romans. Okay, presumably at one time he was a believer of the Roman gods. But now he's a believer in Jehovah, not Jehovah and the other gods, but Jehovah only, which means he recognizes his lordship, that authority of Jehovah, the power of Jehovah, and that if God says he's going to do something, he's going to do it. Okay, so that means that he served fully devoted, fearing Jehovah, recognizing that there is accountability to Jehovah. And so he is, in some cases, he's much further along in his heart and understanding of Jehovah than even some Jews are during the, the period of time that we're talking about. So we see he's devoted and we see he fears God along with all his household. So notice it's not just him, but it, we don't read about necessarily, you know, who, his wife's character or his children's character or who all the household includes, but we know his whole household, presumably multiple people at least, that whether, whether Cornelius had taught them or they all heard about Jehovah at the same time, regardless, Cornelius is the leader of the home and they all are, are, are following his lead in that case. Nolan? <coughs> That would certainly motivate him. Motivate how, how exciting a time it could be for any Gentiles. If you've heard about the Christ, then these things are coming to pass that have been said would come at some point, and nobody knew when. Right. Uh, there were certain markers and things to look for. Right. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Jay, do you have your hand up? No? Okay. All right, so we see the third thing mentioned in verse 2 is that he gave alms generously to the people. Uh, giving alms means what? What, is that, what? what does that say for his character and what does it mean? Okay, he was charitable. All right, he was, he was generous with his uh, means. Uh, generally, that means alms is usually money, but it's not just limited to money. It can be goods or time, clothing, whatever it may be. But he was generous. He was charitable. Now, not only to all the people of Caesarea, but particularly we know that he has a good reputation among the Jews. That being the case, he's charitable to a people that are not his own. And that speaks volumes as well. But these aren't just fellow Romans that he's helping. It would be the Jews that he's helping. Now, as a rule, this is not the case, was this, one, this was not the case for all Romans. But as a rule, especially connected to the Roman government who were stationed in Judea and the surrounding areas, a lot of them had kind of a, uh, I guess you could say a, a negative opinion of the Jewish people, the Jewish nation, of all the trouble that they caused, uh, kind of looked down their nose at them. They, of course, the Jews were kind of second or third class citizens in Rome because they were a conquered people. As a result, they, because they were in that state, generally Romans, purebred Romans, 
didn't really look fondly on the Jews, generally speaking. But here we have this man who was willing to be generous and charitable with the things that he had. And obviously that made an impact in the, the community that he had. Now, I would suggest that his, obviously he has a, what we might would call a good heart. He has a loving heart, it would seem. But, in a, but when you add to that the fact that he was devoted to Jehovah, he feared Jehovah. If he's devoted and he fears Jehovah, then what is he, what is he going to do outwardly? He's going to show that in his conduct, right? If one truly is devoted to Jehovah and fears Jehovah, then they're going to show it in how they act to other people. And certainly giving alms, and he's a public figure, he's a centurion stationed in Caesarea, being charitable in this way, not only does it uh, kind of lend itself to keeping the peace uh, and kind of winning over the population, but I suggest that it was more than just a political or, or motivated by, by keeping the peace, that he truly wanted to help people. And whether that was brought on by being taught to some extent about Jehovah, or whether that was brought on by his upbringing, I don't know. But it's listed here among these four things that God notices and knows about Cornelius. In fact, these two things are going to be mentioned specifically uh, here in verse 4. The fact that your alms and your prayers came up as a memorial before God. So God knows, I would, I would suspect that verse 4 suggests that this is not just something he's doing to try to appease people to keep them at peace. He's doing it because he cares about people. Thoughts through that one. Well, and the Romans were famous for not having a high value of human life who weren't Romans, okay? Romans protected Romans, but when it came to non-Romans, there wasn't, again, this is a general rule, it wasn't true for all of them, but there wasn't a lot of high value placed on other people's lives who weren't part of their empire and, and fellow citizens and so forth. And it shows that he actually cares about people. It doesn't matter if they're Romans or not. He cares about human beings. And, and that certainly speaks to his mindset. Again, whether that was brought on by being taught uh, uh, some, to some extent about Jehovah or whether it was brought on by something else, regardless, this is one of the characteristics that God specifically uh, is borne out by this angel that God says is a memorial. Any other thoughts through that one? And then fourthly, we're told that he prayed always. Prayed to God always. He didn't just pray to his Roman gods, he prayed to Jehovah. Somebody had to teach him how to do that. Uh, I, again, whether he saw it, and so he's following the example of the Jews, whether one of the Jews taught him how to pray to Jehovah, well, whatever, to whatever extent that was, it, the, 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 these th four components really, they mesh well together because it shows the depth of his faith. It shows the depth of his character. That this wasn't just some Jehovah that he would call on all the time, but he was devoted to Jehovah, he feared Jehovah, he prayed to Jehovah always. If I'm praying always, what does that suggest? What other characteristic isn't necessarily listed here, but it's implied? If I'm praying always, what does that mean? Okay, I depend on, I trust on Jehovah. Okay, I put my faith in him and I trust him. And that being the case, when we pray to God, we give God our, our cares, our concerns, our, our problems. We thank him, as is the case in scripture, prayer with thanksgiving. We recognize the blessings he's given us. 
here's this man who wasn't raised, presumably, in understanding what the Jews believed, something he has come to learn later in life, and he has put all of his faith and all of his trust in this God of the Jews. Because he believed, presumably he believed what he was either told or what he read about Jehovah from the Old Testament. Absolutely, absolutely. And, he, and, and, and throughout the account, and we're not going to read the whole account, but throughout the account, he never is hesitant about having a Jew in his home. He's never hesitant about sending for, for Peter. And certainly once Peter gets there, he recognizes, I perceive that God is not a respecter of persons, that it doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile, uh, that God, he wants you to be saved regardless. But yeah, I mean, you see the fact that he is, is, has given himself over to this and all that that means. And he's showing it in his life, showing his character. Anything else through verse 2? All right. So he receives an angel of God, verse 3. Uh, this angel, it's in a vision. The angel of God comes to him saying, Cornelius, verse 4, when he observed him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And so the angel said to him, your prayers and your alms have come up as a memorial before God. Why doesn't the angel mention his devotedness or devoutness and his fear? What is it about these two things that separate them from the other two? Their actions. That's right. I can claim to be devoted and I can claim to have fear all I want to, but until it is borne out in my actions, in my conduct, it doesn't really mean a lot. And so these two things, your prayers, that, those are as an action that I do. And it's an action of, I mean, the very act of prayer, is it not an act of submission, or at least should be, okay, of bowing before Jehovah? and acknowledging his power over me and over all things, okay, that, that, that takes humility. The fact that his alms had come up, God sees the good that he does, that he cares about other people, he's generous, he doesn't put his trust in his whatever riches he has or possessions he has, instead he's put his trust in Jehovah. Those actions speak to the character of devotedness and the character of fear. Of Jehovah, fear of Jehovah. So in verse 5, we see how that the angel tells him he needs to send men to Joppa, send for Simon, whose surname is Peter. He's lodging with Simon the Tanner. He will tell you what you must do, verse 6. Why can't the angel just tell him what he needs to do? I mean, the angel's there already. It would save a lot of time if the angel would just explain to Cornelius what Cornelius needs to do. Why send for Peter? All right. Do we ever once have any example of an angel or spirit ever teaching the gospel to another man? No. Okay. We have Jesus giving his gospel directly to Paul, Paul says, back in Galatians, or forward in Galatians. But we never have like an angel. I mean, when, when, uh, in Acts chapter 8, when Philip was told to go and overtake the chariot to speak to the, uh, to the uh, almost said Philippian jailer, the Ethiopian eunuch, uh, why didn't God just send an angel to the Ethiopian eunuch? Because it's always man teaching man. That's the way the plan of God works. Man comes and teaches and shares what God says with one another. And this is what speaks directly to the, the pattern that we see in the New Testament speaks directly to the concept of divine revelation, uh, of, of uh, God spoke to me today and told me what I need to do, or the idea that uh, revelation that, that saves one. Uh, God spoke to me and now I'm saved. It comes through the teaching of the word. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Romans 10. 
And so this is the pattern that we have. And, and as you see, we don't see any hesitation from Cornelius. So he sends to Joppa. We have Peter's vision here in verse 10 about the, the coming down of the sheet with the different animals in it. Some are clean, some are unclean. And then you have the unclean animals and he's told to go rise, kill and eat. Peter says, no, nothing unclean's ever uh, crossed my lips. And so we come down to verse, <clears throat> verse 19. While Peter was thinking about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are seeking you. Arise, therefore go down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. And in verse 21, Peter sent, went down to the men who'd been sent to him from Cornelius and said, Yes, I am he whom you seek. For what reason have you come? And in verse 22, they said, Cornelius the centurion, a just man, one who fears God and has a good reputation among all the nations of the Jews, was divinely instructed by a holy angel to summon you to his house and to hear words from you. And then we see in verse 23, he invited them in and then they left on the next day. So, these men, as they're sharing some information with Peter here, they, I don't, and I don't know if Cornelius you know, told them what to say, I, I, I doubt it, but these men were conveying the type of person Cornelius is that he received a holy angel who instructed him to send for Peter. But in describing him, they call him a just man. Now, this isn't God saying he was a just man, because just does entail the sense of righteousness or being right in the sight of God. But from their standard, he was a just man. And, of course, devout or devoted can certainly be linked to being just but these men are saying he's a just man. He's a good man. We see one who fears God and he has a good reputation among all the nation of the Jews. So those three things are specifically what they mention. Peter then we find in verse 24 or verse 23, he goes. The following day they entered Caesarea, verse 24. And we see in verse 24, Cornelius was waiting for them. He'd called together his relatives and close friends. Presumably this is beyond just his household. Okay, this is, would presumably this would be more than just those people who lived in his house. We're talking about relatives and close friends. So there, it, sound, it sounds like there's a crowd there. 27, there were many. Yeah, yeah, verse 27. Yeah, you're right. As he talked, he went in and found many who had come together. You're right. I mean, so you've got a, a, a group. Don't know how big exactly, but a group that Cornelius had gathered together to hear the words of Peter. Now, whether all of these also fear Jehovah, I don't know I, I, in that moment. I, I don't know if he, these are ones that maybe he had convinced to also fear Jehovah, or maybe they weren't quite sure. Not sure. But what we do know is that Cornelius, first of all, he was, it sounds like he was excited to hear what words Peter would say, and he wanted others to hear the message as well. So you see the fact that Cornelius, he believed the word of the angel, that this man's going to come and tell us what we need to do. And so we find in verse 25, as Peter's coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. Again, Cornelius, the centurion, one with power over a hundred men of rank and respect of the Roman army, he falls down in front of Peter. Uh, and what, what nationality is Peter? A Jew. A Roman centurion is bowing before Peter. Verse 26, Peter lifted him up saying, Stand up, I myself am also a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many who'd come together. Verse 28, he said to them, You know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or go to one of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Therefore I came without objection as soon as I was sent for. I asked then, For what reason have you sent for me? And in verse 30, Four days. Four days had passed from the time that, that Cornelius received the, the word of the angel in the vision, and those men were able to go to Joppa, bring Peter back to this point. So he recites what happens, tells them what, what took place. Verse 31, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard. Your alms are remembered in the sight of God. Call for Peter. And in uh, verse 33, so I sent to you immediately, and you have done well to come. Now, therefore, we're all present before God to hear all the things commanded you by God. Notice how straight to the point 
that, that Cornelius is. He's there to hear what God says. That's what it's all about. He doesn't waffle about. He doesn't uh, delay or anything else. He says, I sent to you immediately. Then he says, we're all present. We're all here because we want to hear what God wants us to know. And so then in verse 34, Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. Now, this verse is taken out of context a lot to say that as long as you fear God and do good things, that you're saved. Is that what Peter's saying? This is on the heels of, I've received that God shows no partiality. There's no difference between Jew or Greek. But in verse 35, in every nation, it doesn't matter if they're a Jew, a Gentile, whoever fears him and works righteousness, does those things that God considers right, they are accepted by Him. Exactly. Really, ultimately, if, if what Peter says is all that there is, then Cornelius is already saved. So then what's the point of the rest of it? So then what does Peter mean? If that's not the case, what does Peter mean by is accepted by him. Because people take that phrase, is accepted by him, to mean salvation. If that's not salvation, then what is it? Can anyone be saved who does not fear God? Can anyone be saved who doesn't fear God? No. No. Because they're not going to submit to him. They're not going to care what he says. They have no respect for Jehovah. And then those who aren't willing to work righteousness, those who aren't willing to allow the actions to come forth from a character of fear and devotion, they believe in God, but only up to a point. They're not willing to actually do it in their life. Can anybody be saved in that state? No. No. So then, what are we talking about? Are we talking about saved people in verse 35? Or are we talking about people who are prepared to be saved? The right to become. Not that they already became, but the right to become. Their hearts are ready. Their hearts are prepared. And in this case, I mean... Is there any better example of a, of a candidate for salvation than Cornelius? He's ready. Ben? Absolutely. No more, because God has made clean, do not call unclean. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's exactly what Peter's point in verse 35 is, is that anyone who is willing to submit and do as God has commanded, God will take them and will use them. Okay? God can save these individuals. Not that they are already saved, but that they can be saved. Just as Cornelius was not already saved, But his heart is ready. His mind is ready to become saved. So, yeah. Right. Well, you know, and it could very well. Go ahead. Yeah. He was a good man and everything, but he knew there was more. Yeah. And that's where his passion uh, really came into play. Yeah. Not for saving everything else, but for the sake of his family and his family. Yeah. And that's what he did. Yeah. And that's what he did. Yeah. And that's what he did. Because he knew he knew he was lacking. Yeah. He was a good man.
Well, you know, and in our current, well, and it's been this way for a number of years now, but you've got the, the thought process that you can, you feel that God has saved you. Okay, the people that, that, that believe in faith only, they accept Jesus into their heart and they can feel that they've been saved. And some people refer to a saving experience. Well, Cornelius could have easily said, well, I had an angel talk to me. Obviously, God likes me. I'm saved. And how many people in the religious world who believe in God, receiving an angel telling them to do something, just automatically say, I'm not going to do that. God obviously likes me. I'm saved. But it goes to show that, what was it that the angel said? He will tell you what you must what? Do. It wasn't just a matter of what you must know or what you must believe, but what you must do. And so we see as Peter continues teaching, he talks about Jesus. He talks about the fact that he was raised from the dead. Uh, And in verse 43, to him all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. So in verse 44, Peter was still speaking these words. The Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. Those of the circumcision, who would be what? The Jews. These are Christian Jews who'd come with Peter who believed or were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. <clears throat> All right. So, after Peter had said these things, the Holy Spirit comes upon the house of Cornelius. The, the Jews, Peter and the rest of these brethren, they know it, because it was the same exact thing that happened on the day of Pentecost with the, the tongues as of fire. Okay, not literal tongues of fire, but tongues as of fire that uh, what kind of appeared above the heads of, of the apostles in Acts chapter 2. Well, here they see it and they, see, uh, the, they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. No, no, I, I take that back. It doesn't say anything about tongues of fire. It just says that they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Uh, So that might be the only way they they saw that they had the the Spirit there in verse 46. Uh, But they're speaking with tongues. What does speaking with tongues mean? Yeah, different languages. Languages that they shouldn't know, but because the Holy Spirit's given them that knowledge, they do know and magnify God. Now, is it the same exact thing as that happened in Acts chapter 2 in that they then, the whole household of Cornelius received miraculous gifts to heal people, to raise people from the dead, to do other stuff? Do they have all of the gifts of the apostles? Are they now like a household of apostles now? Now, I think it's important that we see in verse 46, it's limited to, at least temporarily, it's limited to, and I say that because it doesn't mean that the house of Cornelius continued until they died with these gifts as opposed to the apostles. Okay, I don't know that they did. But at least in this moment, they had the gift to speak with tongues. And of course, in doing so, they were magnifying God, just as the apostles did in the day of Pentecost. So in verse 47, you would think, written to a lot of people's minds, in fact, I would say as of verse 43, would you say that Cornelius has probably accepted Jesus into his heart at that point? I think, I think Cornelius is listening and believing every word Peter's saying. So as of verse 43, I think Cornelius has accepted Jesus into his heart. But then to top it off, now he's received the Holy Spirit in so much as they're able to speak in tongues. Wouldn't he be saved now? If that's the case, verse 47, can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. What's the purpose of baptism if they were already saved? Some some will argue from from Acts 10 
that it was just an outward sign of an inward faith. Or they'll argue that that was just the custom, but they were already saved. Well, notice how Peter says this. Can anyone forbid water? As if this is a key component. This is an important step, an important process. Can anyone forbid it? Do any of you, can any of you say that there, there's no, a reason why we shouldn't baptize them? And then in verse 48, he didn't just say you should be baptized. It's a good idea to be baptized. What does he say? He commanded them to be baptized. When you issue a command, isn't that, doesn't that kind of imply that what's being said is important? What's being told you to do is important? Commanded. Well, and up to this point, and here's the key component to that. What is it the angel said? He will tell you the things that you must do. Well, up to verse 43, and even through into verse 46, had Cornelius really been told anything to do yet? I mean, he's been told about Jesus. He's been told about Jesus being sacrificed, told that he was raised from the dead. But Cornelius was just listening, obviously believing. And then you have the Holy Spirit coming upon them, but that Cornelius really didn't do anything for that to happen. It was God doing it. So what has Cornelius done up to this point in verse 46? And at what point has Peter told them what they must do? Up to verse 46. Nothing. It isn't until verse 47 and 48 that they're told what to do. He commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. The angel said, he will tell you what you must do. Verse 33, tell us what is commanded us to do. Well, it isn't until verse 47, 48 that that happens. Ben? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a really good point. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that. That connection to that, I mean, it, you know, the, the, the Romans were big on you follow orders, all right? And, and all militaries are. But, I mean, you think about this centurion and, and following orders and tell me what to do. It's very straightforward. And what does Peter do? He tells them, he commands them to be baptized. And that's exactly what happens. And, of course, then you link the rest of this to other passages like Mark 16, 16, he that believes that is baptized shall be saved. You link to Galatians chapter 3. I mean, all of this leads us to understand that the doing part takes place in verse 47 and 48. All right, any other thoughts or comments through Cornelius? Yes, sir. That's true. Yet, yeah. That was unlawful, but something's changing today, right now. That's a good point. That's not how it is anymore. That's a good point. Yep. It's unlawful, or was unlawful, but this is different. All right. All right, everybody. Thank you very much. We'll pick up with Julius the Centurion next Wednesday. Thank you, everybody.